Hello and welcome to Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. I'm Mike Allen, here with another story about historically significant people, places, and events from Connecticut's long and fabled past. Today on Amazing Tales, it was the oldest and longest running state fair in U.S. history when it closed in the 1980s. The Great Danbury State Fair ran 112 years before being replaced by a mall. It's such a large story, we're splitting it into two parts. In part one, we're going to talk about the early years of the fair, how it formed and grew, in a way you've likely never heard it told before by a true insider. My guests are Jack Stetson, one of the last two persons to actually run the Danbury Fair and a fountain of knowledge about this iconic piece of American history, and Bill Devlin, noted Danbury historian who has some excellent insights on the fair. And now stay tuned for part one of There Was Never Anything Quite Like the Great Danbury State Fair. It's an amazing piece of Americana, the Great Danbury State Fair. Many would argue it was one of the best state fairs ever held in the United States. It certainly held the record for longevity when it shut down for good. 112 years of near-continuous operation interrupted only by World War II. Like most things that started in the 1800s in the U.S., it had a strong association with agriculture. Even though the Industrial Revolution had made its mark with factories and railroads springing up everywhere, the main source of work and income in the U.S. in the mid-1800s was still agriculture. The name one hears most frequently associated with the success of the Danbury Fair is John W. Leahy. He was a P.T. Barnum type who knew how to show the public a fun time. In fact, as a child, he would hold circuses in his backyard for neighborhood children and adults to visit. Jack Stetson's an integral part of the Danbury State Fair due to his involvement with John Leahy. You see, Leahy was Jack Stetson's step-grandfather. Jack's grandmother, Gladys, had made her way as a teacher southward from the state of Maine, where the family was not well off, getting ever better paying positions as she went. She ended up teaching at Danbury High School, she, and she taught there in the English department for three years and met John W. Leahy, who was a bachelor, confirmed bachelor. Uh, his idea of life was work. But Leahy changed his bachelor status, and he married Jack's grandmother, making Jack now a part of the Leahy family dynasty. For Jack Stetson, his involvement with the fair was a lifelong affair from his earliest memories. There are a variety of stories told in Danbury about how the fair began back in the 1860s, but Jack Stetson is considered the authoritative voice on all things having to do with the fair and its history. He even published a book on the topic with his grandmother. It's the only book ever published exclusively on the Danbury Fair, although the fair, of course, has been mentioned hundreds of times in other books and articles. So how did the fair begin? Well, one common story that is often heard is that it harkens back to the days of the Fairfield County Agricultural Society. Jack says that group stood for the improvement and encouragement of agriculture and domestic manufacturing. They held an annual cattle show and fair each year in a different town in Fairfield County. They'd hold it in the month of October. The fair rotated between Danbury and Norwalk and even sometimes as far away as New Haven. October was an important month because it's when farmers were done for the season. The harvest was over and they had time for such things as a fair. Eventually, though, the Fairfield County Agricultural Society fairs died out. So if that wasn't the source, where did the fair come from? Well, Jack says the real story had to do with horse racing. The sport of kings was known as horse racing, and it was also the sport of Danbury hatters and uh, machine shop owners and bankers and whatnot. Back in the 1860s, there were two major horse farms in Danbury where trotters were bred, raised, and trained. The first was where the Ridgewood Country Club and golf course sits today. The other was Hilltop Stock Farms. It was owned by German immigrant William Beckerley. He came to this country penniless, but he made a sizable fortune in the hattie industry and then created the horse farm. 
It was located where Danbury High School is found today on Route 39. These two farms used to compete their trotters against one another on the grounds where the fair would eventually be located. There was a small horse racing track there. And because their rivalry was so intense around town, their friends and supporters would show up en masse to watch the races. And that caught the eye of a number of entrepreneurs in the young, growing city. In particular, Samuel Rundell and George White. They decided to up the game a bit. They also owned trotters. They would race them at that small track in Danbury but also at officially sanctioned tracks elsewhere around Fairfield County. They wanted to upgrade Danbury's track to make it an officially sanctioned facility. This way, the outcome of the races in Danbury would be more meaningful. They got together with a bunch of other investors. They purchased that property, redid the racetrack to something that met the specifications of the sanctioning body, and built a little grandstand and started racing, and this was in August of 1869. Back then, there simply wasn't much else to do in Danbury than these horse races. A few other movers and shakers in the city saw what was developing and suggested having a fair on the property. They targeted the traditional month for fairs, October. So just a few months after the sanctioned horse track was approved, Jack says they formed the Danbury Farmers and Manufacturers Association and decided to press ahead. And the first week in October, with a borrowed tent from P.T. Barnum, uh, they had their first fair. The very first year, they turned a profit, and the fair was on its way to a 112-year run. They plowed their profits uh, into the fairgrounds and built buildings, improved the racetrack, and the crowds grew. Uh, The other fairs around the state kind of died out because they didn't have enough support. At that time, downtown Danbury was industrial. The hat and comb manufacturing industries were in high gear. But the rest of the region was still heavily agricultural in nature. And Jack says that the fair manager, Samuel Rundell, reflected that reality at the fair. Cattle exhibits, poultry exhibits. They had a bench show, which meant dogs. They would bring in samples of their hay that they grew and they were competitive in their vegetables and all manner of things. In time, the fair also took on another important dimension. It served as a world's fair of sorts, where the latest in science technology was on display. The Edison light bulb was invented. The telephone was invented. A number of other things were shown at the fair in their infancy as being things of the future. Danbury historian Bill Devlin notes that, indeed, the Great Danbury State Fair was a place where you could find the latest in technologies over many decades. Fairs introduced new new things, like whether it was hot air balloons or airplanes or cars. Bill says you have to remember that the fair was around showing off gadgets and technologies long before they became commonplace in society. Sometimes this was the first time people in this rural area had seen these things. Of course, there was no TV, you know, no movies. The fairs were the place you you saw new things. Once flying became established, the fair used the Danbury Airport right next door to show off new airplanes and offer rides to fairgoers from what was then still a grass field. All of these attractions drew attention not only from the immediate Danbury region, but from much further beyond, as did the horse racing, which continued during Fair Week. But Jack says it was indeed Samuel Rundell who successfully built up the fair in the early years. After he passed away, his son Mortimer Rundell took over. Well, the fair survived the Great Depression in the 1930s, but as the 40s came around, Mortimer was hit with a problem as World War II broke out. The fair had closed in 1941 because of rationing. Gasoline was rationed, tires were rationed, steel was rationed. Six million men went off to war. There was no way that the fair could operate under those circumstances. It remained closed until the end of the war in 1945. In 1943, John Leahy bought the Great Danbury State Fair from Mortimer Rundell. Leahy was the owner of Leahy Fuels on White Street, a seller of oil, propane, and appliances. Jack says his step-grandfather was a self-made man, and he was Danbury born and raised. He uh, started out with an eighth-grade education. He went for the Baumforth Avenue School, 
and he lived and was born in Nine Baum Fourth Avenue, and his whole world was was centered around White Street. John Leahy had a good eye for business, something that served him well early in life. After leaving school in the eighth grade, he spent a few years as an apprentice in the machine shop. Then his father died when John Leahy was still a young man. So he opted to open his own business to help support his surviving family. A salesman came through town uh, exhibiting the automatic oil burner to heat your home. And John looked at that and he said, this is the, uh, the thing of the future. He realized that this new technology meant nobody would need to carry coal or wood to their furnace to heat their homes, nor would they have to shovel those pesky ashes. Well, before Leahy Fuel was formed, which is a Danbury mainstay, Leahy had started the Norwalk Oil Company in 1934. It was a wholesale oil business. By 1937, he decided to add propane to the venture. Well, now comes the amazing part of the story. Jack says that this part of the story involved a customer of Leahy's heating oil business. A customer came into the office here, and uh, she was in arrears in her oil bill, and she wanted to, to be caught up in one way, and she said, Mr. Leahy, the only thing I have that I can offer you, I own a single share of the Danbury Fair. When the offer came to own a share of the fair, Jack says his grandfather jumped at it. He thought, well, that was pretty good because this was show business, and he ran these little circuses in his backyard as a kid and always went to the fair, and he accepted that. Well, it seems the transaction became a pretty deep dinner table discussion between John and Gladys Leahy, who, incidentally, Jack always referred to as Aunt Gladys. He came home that afternoon to uh, Aunt Gladys, Mrs. Leahy, and he said, Gladdy, he said, uh, you know, never know what I did today. And um, she was used to surprises. And she said, well, John, what did you do today? He said, well, I bought a share of the Danbury Fair. Jack says Aunt Gladys had a follow-up question. And she paused a moment and she said, why, John, what are you ever going to do with that? And he said, well, I don't really know. But he did know. And the next morning, he went right down to the Danbury Fair offices. Well, John Leahy walked down to the offices of Mortimer Rundell on Main Street. He told Mortimer and his partner that he had bought the single share. And he wanted to know what would it take to obtain the remainder of the shares of the fair. And they said, well, that's interesting. Uh, he wanted to know what it was worth, and he paid $100 for it in, in trade. And they thought, yeah, it's probably worth $100, but you need to understand that everything in show business isn't the way it seems in the front. Well, with that, they rolled out a list of the problems facing the fair. Chief among them was the debt that they had incurred to recover from a fire at the fairgrounds. In 1941, a fire had destroyed the Big Top and the administrative offices. Unfortunately, that's the same year the fair closed due to the war. That meant that the normal flow of revenue wasn't coming in. And that meant that the debt for rebuilding the Big Top and offices hadn't been paid. Well, it turns out Mortimer Rundell had remortgaged the fair itself to pay for the repairs, and without that incoming revenue, they were substantially behind in the payments. John, according to Jack, decided to strike a deal. John looked at all over, and he talked them into selling him some more shares, and little by little, uh, between 1943 and 1945, he became the majority stockholder and started plowing his personal money into fixing what needed to be fixed at the Danbury Fair in hopes that when the war was over, he'd be able to open it up. And that's what happened. Indeed, from 1945 going forward, the Great Danbury State Fair continued to grow and grow. It drew crowds from throughout the Northeast, loading the fairgrounds each day it was open with as many people who watch a professional football game today, 50 to 60,000 on average. Jack Stetson's involvement with the family business, both the oil propane business as well as the fair, began when he was young. At first, he started a lawn mowing service where he borrowed a lawnmower to cut the lawn of one of John Leahy's friends. He had finished his first weekly service and was preparing for week two when his phone rang. Fred Fern, who was my father's boss, called me on the phone and said, you know, we have an opening here. He said, would you like to be the office boy? 
And I said, sure, I wouldn't have to push the lawnmower anymore. So my lawn mowing career lasted one week. Then when Jack entered high school, he qualified for one of John Leahy's coveted summer positions. John would hire school boys, basically college boys and high school boys, to work at the fairgrounds painting and mowing lawns and stuff in the summer. God, we had a good time. We couldn't believe we got paid for this. Of course, the pay was only $1.50 an hour. Well, Bill Devlin also managed to obtain one of those positions. He recalls that there was a tradition where Leahy himself would greet the workers at the end of the day and personally hand them their pay at the main gate. It was not what I was expecting. Um, he was uh, very old at that point and um, standing by the gate and, uh, you know, it was, it was just very businesslike. Jack Stetson had, meantime, started to work his way up through the Leahy organization. At first, he had an arrangement that drew him exceptionally close to the fair. My wife and I lived on the fairgrounds for five years. Uh, I was the caretaker. I, Mr. Leahy had um, a, a herd of sheep, a herd of llamas, um, ducks and chickens in the summer to raise in preparation for the fair. Uh, and I had to feed those before work in the morning and after work when I came home. Jack took care of the grounds year-round so he could save up money for a new house. I plowed all the snow over there on a 1946 Ford tractor with no hydraulics on it, all open to the snow. I would come with icicles hanging off my glasses. We did this in lieu of rent. He began as a propane service agent and a driver of oil and propane trucks. Then he serviced propane tanks. He spent some time in the reserves during the Vietnam War. And after that, he went to work in the Leahy office as dispatcher, service manager, appliance sales manager, and parts department manager. He did it all. Well, that's where we're going to have to leave it off for part one of our two-part series on the Great Danbury State Fair. In part two, we're going to have the unbelievable story about the modernization of the fair, and the exceptionally sad story about its ultimate demise, that after its record-setting 112 years of operation. That's it for this episode of Amazing Tales from Off and On Connecticut's Beaten Path, part one of our two-part series on the Great Danbury State Fair. I want to thank my guests for this episode, Jack Stetson, one of the last two persons to run the Great Danbury State Fair, and noted Danbury historian Bill Devlin. Please follow me at my main podcast website, amazingtalesct.podbean.com. Also, in between episodes, you can check out my Facebook page at Amazing Tales CT. I love hearing from you, and you can always send me an idea for a story you'd like me to look into. If you liked what you heard, spread the word with your family and friends. See you next time here on Amazing Tales from off and on Connecticut's beaten path. I'm Mike Allen. Be safe and stay healthy. <laughs>